I'm Teresa Binken, CEO of National Speakers Bureau Canada and Global Speakers Agency. And we envision that the sharing of ideas inspires action to make the world a better place. They're bringing you expert speakers and thought leaders for your conferences, training programs and events, whether they be in person, online or hybrid. And I'm pleased to introduce our, one of our newest speakers to our exclusive roster. A thought leader, change agent and an impact focused innovator Alfredo Tan has led companies through changing digital landscapes, evolving consumer expectations and behaviors. He's held senior level roles with WestJet, Facebook, Instagram, Yahoo, and Rogers Media. As an immigrant to Canada from the Philippines, he spent his life in the pursuit of higher education and in sharing that knowledge whenever he could, rising to the highest levels of corporate leadership in a range of industries. Alfredo is currently the Senior Vice President of Strategy, Data and Products at Rogers Sports and Media. And prior to this, he was the Chief Marketing Officer and the first Chief Digital and Innovation Officer at WestJet Airlines. A former Facebook and Instagram executive, he was a founding team member at Facebook Canada way back in 2009. And he went on to help launch Facebook and Instagram in the Philippines as the first country manager. Alfredo was also a senior director at Yahoo in Silicon Valley as a member of the Connected Life team. And he's been profiled and quoted in Forbes, Strategy, Marketing Magazines, The Economist, The Globe and Mail, among others. Alfredo currently sits on the advisory board on innovation at McMaster University and is a member of the Leadership Council at the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics. He's also a founding member of the Canadian chapter of the Harvard Alumni Entrepreneurs Organization. In his inspiring presentations, Alfredo shares lessons learned along the way on disruption, innovation, and success. Welcome, Alfredo. Thanks so much, Teresa, for having me. Looking forward to sharing some of the stories of the companies that I've had a front row seat at and the privilege of living in this incredible country. So maybe I'll start off at the beginning, which is, this is a, one of my favorite photos. It's a photo of uh, my grandma, my mom, and my dad, and they took the biggest risk of, of their life by deciding to immigrate to this wonderful country, leaving our beautiful homeland where we, we didn't have very much. And um, I often think about how this decision changed the trajectory of my life and how important this was um, in terms of setting me up for success in the future. And life was never easy, but I feel like out of all the things that have happened, I've won the geography lottery. And that geography lottery is you know, being able to live in this country and apply um, to some great schools and eventually land some great jobs along the way. And one of the stories I like to tell is I, I feel very fortunate that many of the brands I've had to work, I got the chance to work for have given me the opportunity to have a front row seat on some of the biggest challenges these organizations have faced in history. And then when I think about my academic career, I, I often choose disciplines where I have least the least knowledge of so I can expand my learning capabilities. And the way I think about that both personally, professionally and academically is what are the opportunities I have where the risk of failure is equal to the risk of success, um, the, the rate of success is equal to the rate of failure. And I think of it that way because that's where I think the greatest learning opportunity lies. And more importantly, the, um, the greatest opportunity for growth as well. And let me sort of talk about that from a business standpoint and some lessons that have happened in the last sort of 10 to 20 years and what this is gonna look like increasingly as the world becomes increasingly more complex and moves faster. So there's this concept that I like talking about, which is slow and then quick. If we look back in the late 1990s, I actually have this magazine on my, um, on my bookshelf. And this is Jeff Bezos as the CEO of Amazon. In 1999, all Amazon sold was books. But it's, easily, uh, it's easy to forget that today he is so dominant in almost every industry they operate in that we forget that 20 years ago, this is what they did. And this is an example of slow but quick. We weren't paying attention. And then one day it feels like they're in every industry disrupting whatever sort of business they want to enter. In 2014, I have a, what I call a geek debate in San Francisco with a few of my technology friends. We're having dinner in a uh, San Francisco restaurant uh, in Union Square. And one of the topics we were discussing was, do we think Tesla's overvalued? I believe it was trading at 70 or $80 at the time. And we were all wrong. We said, yeah, we think as a car company, they haven't sold very many cars, they're overvalued and uh, not sure what their runway is gonna be. And we're in the industry, we got it completely wrong. In May of 2021, this is Tesla's market capitalization at $649 billion. 
which is greater than the auto and airline industries combined. In less than six months, Tesla now has a valuation that a market cap of $1 trillion, which is larger than all of these companies combined because they're only worth $955 billion. An example of slow but quick, right? So Tesla was founded in the early 2000s and no one was paying attention. And then one day there are a trillion dollars, an example of slow but quick. And it's easy to look back on pandemics or epidemics and think about them as areas of opportunity because when you're living them, they feel very painful and oftentimes hopelessness, but this is where some of the greatest opportunity can lie. So in 2009 and 2008 time period during the uh, global financial crisis, two key engineers um, end up being laid off uh, during that crisis at a company I used to work at called Yahoo. And while they were looking for work, one of them was tweeting live every time he would go through an interview in Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley, highly competitive for software and engineering talent. And that's the, that's the roles that they had. And they were tweeting this as they were being rejected from job to job. Got denied by Twitter headquarters. That's okay. Would have been a long commute. Facebook turned me down. It was a great opportunity to connect with some fantastic people looking forward to life's next adventure. So Brian and his co-founder, Yom, decided to build a messaging company because they couldn't get a job in Silicon Valley where they were where they were let go from Yahoo and thought they could do a better job creating a messaging app than what was currently available. The app that they created was called WhatsApp. And in 2014, they were acquired for $19 billion. So in four years, in a global epidemic of, on the finance side, they went from a no valuation company to $19 billion. My favorite part of the story is when they had to sign the paperwork to close the $19 billion transaction, um, that face, as Facebook was acquiring them, is one of the co-founders wanted to sign the paperwork in a part of the city that most people thought made no sense. Most of the time you sign your deal either at the venture capital firm, at your law firm, or even your own offices. He ended up signing the paperwork where him and his mom used to collect food stamps when they were immigrants to the United States. So just a fantastic story of incredible innovation in a time of disruption in such a short period of time, which was less than five years. And then maybe in the industry that I used to operate in, which is aviation, we used to talk about how our biggest, on my team anyways, we used to talk about the biggest threat was not going to be another airline. It was an unseen or un, um, circumstances that we didn't understand would affect the industry. And that's pretty much what happened. If you think about COVID-19, before COVID-19, most airlines thought they were competing with other airlines. We thought our biggest competitor was Air Canada. And if you look at this today, most businesses decide, is this good enough for Zoom or Microsoft Teams, or do we really need to get on a plane? Zoom's market capitalization is now bigger than the sort of seven biggest airline holding companies in the world. And this is another example of slow but quick. It seemed like it came out of nowhere, but video conference technology was already in development decades before this phenomenon. And I want you to process this. Despite all the change that has happened in the past, Today is the slowest rate of change we will ever experience again. The same will be tomorrow, the same will be Friday, the same will be next Monday. There will be no slower time period than the one we're living right now, and it's constantly accelerating. And one of the areas that I, I wanna just expand your imagination on is we're entering an era called the fourth industrial revolution. The first industrial revolution was around the mechanization of processes through steam, the fourth industrial revolution will be the converging of three systems, biological, physical, and digital systems, where suddenly the virtual world and the real world are gonna to start to collide. And it's gonna be harder and harder to distinguish the difference between the two. And this may sound like science fiction, but let me bring some reality to it. You may have heard the announcements and there was lots of joking. I have no affiliation with Facebook anymore, but Facebook changed its name to Meta. I'm not sure it was such a bad idea. I think it depends on how history plays itself out. So meta is short for the metaverse, which I just explained is gonna be the combining of the physical and digital worlds. If Mark Zuckerberg and the Facebook executive team are right, and the metaverse becomes as big as the internet, maybe owning the trademarks, all the labels and the patents around meta will be considered a brilliant move in 20 years. Because we often forget the word internet comes from the word inner network. Imagine if a decades ago, someone said they wanted to name their company internet. I'm trying to create a comparison that meta um, may be the corollary to internet and the internet work. 
And a company called Snapchat with many of our friends or um, kids or cousins um, or the people around us, we think of it as a messaging app, but they have some of the most advanced augmented reality technology today where they already have been thinking about the metaverse far be before even Facebook had decided to change their name to Meta. This is an example of sunglasses that starts to capture the world around you. So you don't even need your phone to be able to do that. And then on your screen, you're able to see the merging of the physical and digital worlds. And to take this even further, uh, I won't go into the technology of NFT, but a few months ago in March, the world's first digital house sold for 500,000 US dollars. To be clear, you cannot enter this house physically. It only exists in the digital world. But maybe one day if the metaverse becomes real, it's good to have a house that you invested in early. And just to give you a sense for how fast the intelligence of computing is rising, I'm just gonna show you a quick illustration here with a graph that on the bottom axis just shows the years. On the Y axis is the computations per second per thousand dollars. So think of it as computing horsepower for a thousand dollars. In the year 2019, so about two years ago, you could buy the computational horsepower of one mouse's brain for $1,000. By the year 2030, one human brain's total computational horsepower will cost you $1,000. And in the not so distant future around 2059, 8 billion people's combined computational horsepower, horsepower will be available for less than $1,000. This isn't science fiction. This doesn't suppose new technology. This just takes into account the current trends of computing horsepower versus cost. And if you think about the medical field, in the next 10 years, data science and software is predicted to do more for medicine than all of the biological sciences combined. This seems like science fiction as well, but let me give you an illustration of this. So in the late 1880s, a doctor comes up with the first ECG machine, which is how we measure the electrical activity of the heart. In the hospital, you can get one of these and it doesn't take up a room anymore. And it's called, it's still an ECG. And it's a 12 lead ECG, which is how doctors diagnose the condition of your heart and is used in emergencies when people are having heart attacks or other heart diseases. For less than $200, you can now buy a six lead ECG machine. So half the number of leads at the hospital, but you are now able to do this at the comfort of your home at any time you want for almost no cost and send the information over the internet to a medical professional to see what is going on with your heart in a way that wasn't possible before. So it took a hundred years for us to get here. So that's the slow part. Imagine how quickly this is gonna transform diagnostic medicine in the future. And I'm gonna now ground this in why innovation is so hard. It's actually not related to the technology and the advancements of science that I was talking about. A lot of it has to do more with culture and organizations. The biggest threat to innovation isn't usually the outside competition. It's internal politics, an organizational culture which doesn't accept failure and doesn't accept ideas from the outside and simply cannot change. And here are some of my tips just quickly in our time together on how I believe culture wins over technology. And, and this is gonna sound simple, but these are really, really hard. In most of the companies I've worked for, the culture piece is way harder than solving the technology areas. How do you empower people to run experiments without management overhead? How do you embrace a culture that accepts and learns from 10, 12, 18, 30 failures in order to win? Can you hire intellectually curious people, those that thrive in ever-changing environments? Can you nurture challengers, encourage healthy, respectful debate and tension? Do you create a culture where you're allowed to avoid hippos whenever you can? A hippo is the highest paid person's opinion. And most importantly, my favorite one is, the speed at which an organization can learn will be a competitive advantage, if not the competitive advantage. So maybe I'll take it back to how I opened the story of my um, immigration from my homeland by playing a video that inspired me to think about what the world could be like one day. This is a video from 1999, and it's one of my favorite because it's just a reminder of how quickly things change. The, the pixelation on the video is an important, if you can just listen to the audio, there's a few key Imagine if scenarios that have captured people that captured my imagination on why I wanted to get into tech. The web has more users in its first five years than telephone did in their first 30. A population the size of the United Kingdom joins the internet every six months. One day the internet will make long distance calls the sing of the past. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Virtually 
all internet traffic travels across the systems of one company, Cisco Systems, empowering the internet generation. Are you ready? One day, long distance calls will be the thing of the past. I couldn't imagine what that would be like. When my family first came here, we couldn't afford to make long distance calls for my mom to call her, um, her parents back home. In fact, it would take us three months to save up for a 30 minute call. And that was just simply voice. You couldn't even see the other person on the other side. So when I got a chance to go back to my homeland of the Philippines in 2016, this is my mom's family home, which has been renovated a few times uh, over the decades. We still did not have access to running hot water in the Philippines. So when we, when we visit, we have to boil our water in order to be able to bathe. However, everyone in the house above the age of 13 and below the age of 80 had a mobile phone and connectivity to the internet. The prediction from 1999 came true, long distance calls became free. And in a fairy tale story ending for me, I, I left um, the Philippines in poverty and I came back to be the first country manager as Teresa was mentioning, made it on the front page of um, one of the most important newspapers as we launched Facebook um, for one of the most important countries in Southeast Asia. Thank you and I apologize for the internet connection earlier and I look forward to uh, answer any questions that I can. Thank you, Alfredo, much appreciated. And uh, you've given us a lot to think about, especially the uh, slow and then fast, as you say, some things just seem to come out of nowhere, but uh, as with many things, it takes a lot of years to get there. <clears throat> uh, we are happy to take some questions and feel free to use the Q&A function. Um, I'll go through a couple to start. Um, it was uh, it was helpful when you touched on um, the automotive industry and healthcare industry. Can you talk a bit about the financial industry and how that might be impacted by uh, Web 3.0 or the metaverse, for example? Well, I, I you know, Teresa, that that's it's a great question. If if you look at my example of the NFT, which is buying the house, that's considered fintech, right? So there's health tech, there's retail tech. I, I think financial services is gonna be a fascinating industry to watch with the advent of blockchain, which is a distributed way of recording transactions. So, so I think there's gonna be enormous advancement in financial services. And, and in fact, it's probably one of the most exciting spaces because so many different parts of the world are experimenting this area. For example, El Salvador, um, a country that had economic crisis, has their national currencies in Bitcoin. Right. I'm not suggesting that's the policy for other countries, but you can see everything from the type of transactions we'll be able to run with new technology, the security protocols that are being built into place, and more importantly, maybe the decentralization of who's controlling the financial transactions. Right. Today, big organizations run the financial transactions. There's going to be this concept of more distributed, decentralized um, transactions taking place. So, so I think there's going to be an incredible disruptive force happening if, if, if people aren't aware it's already happening. Thank you for that. Uh, we have a question from Trish asking about how does a company move away from the HIPPO mindset, which is, uh, I hadn't heard that acronym before. So thank you for that. Yeah, yeah, great question. So this is the hardest part, right? So of course I put it on a slide and it looks like, oh, all of those things are obvious. It's, it's what I spend 80% of my day despite having a technology background in a technology role. So, so this is one, I'll answer it at the highest levels. One is it has to start from the top, right? So there has to be a desire at the most senior levels of organizations that you, you wanna create a cultural transformation by acknowledging what you did today is gonna to get you to the future. Number two, you need to tie mechanisms to the intention. So everyone has great intentions, right? What, what companies often lack is what's the mechanism in place to make that uh, intention come to life. So let me give you a practical example of that. Everyone has an intention to make better work-life balance in the workplace. What ends up happening is people are inundated with meetings. There's no boundaries for work. So there's no mechanism in place to make the intention come to life. One of the things that we did at Rogers Sports and Media that we launched and then the rest of Rogers copied was we said, what if we said no meetings would be allowed on Thursday afternoons from noon till six? It gives everyone freedom to do their work and there was a boundary being set. We didn't know the answer to that, but we had to try. We ran the experiment. It was wildly successful. It made people feel like they have freedom. The weekend felt like it was coming earlier and it was so good. We decided to expand it to the entire Rogers 
organization, which is over 24,000 people. So the answer to the question is complex, which is has to get executive support. There has to be a mindset around experimentation to try things, even if it doesn't work, you're willing to try again. And then three, there has to be mechanisms in place beyond just the intentions on a slide. And that's still an oversimplification because if you do this right, it should take you years to get to the, the, the destination on this. And in fact, there's probably never a destination. It's the constant transformation of the culture in addition to the constant transformation around the technology. Thank you, very helpful. <clears throat> we have a question from Kelly, uh, who's wondering about uh, the internal politics um, reference that you made and is wondering actually if you're able to bring back that slide. So she's asked specifically, is it possible to see Alfredo's first slide again about internal politics? It was powerful, but I missed a lot of it. Can you see that now, Teresa? Yes, thank you. Great. So I, I, I referenced this slide because often the excuse we make when someone is doing something better than us is they're just a better organization. They have more resources, they have more money, or the, the conditions in the environment. We blame COVID, we, we talk about COVID-19. We talk about all these externalities on why we can't succeed. But if you think about what really causes the challenge is it's often the internal culture politics and organizational culture, which is really the thing to overcome. And the good news is that's the thing you control. The externalities that we often reference as somewhat excuses are the things you can't anyways. So I, I, I really like the slide as a, uh, as a context setting for how you can transform your culture to make sure that you're ready for all the changes I've just described. Because the technology will somewhat be commoditized over time. Your competitive advantage is the culture you build, which is often overused, but also the reason why companies can't innovate for the next generation of what's taking place because they're stuck doing what they've always done. Thank you for that. I hope that uh, that helps, Kelly. Wonderful. Yes, she says, thank you so much. <laughs> That's great. You know what? We were able to answer a number of questions and uh, we're about time to wrap it up in any case. So. Thank you all for joining us uh, today and Alfredo for um, your insights on disruption and innovation. I really appreciated um, your, uh, your theme of expand your imagination and we'll continue uh, with that mindset going forward. Um, we look forward to seeing our uh, viewers in another two weeks. We try to host these every two weeks and we'll be bringing in uh, Farah Khan on consent culture in the workplace. So uh, we look forward to seeing you again and uh, we'll be happy to share a recording of this session for um, everyone who RSVP'd as a follow-up email and if there were any outstanding questions we will check with Alfredo and see if we can uh, get some insights in those areas for you. Thank you so much for your chat notes, uh, fantastic keynote, so good and thank you again Alfredo for joining us. Take care Great, everyone. Thank you so much.